Hi folks, welcome to our uh, Texas Master Naturalist TMN Tuesday webinar event, our last in our 2023 series. Um, there goes the uh, lunch bell here in uh, where I'm joining in from in Central Texas. Um, so we're going to get started with our TMN Tuesday webinar. Uh, today's topic is land stewardship. It might not be what you think. Before we get into our topic and introducing our speakers, um, I'd like to do just a quick tech check and make sure that everybody can uh, participate in today's event fully. Um, if you've been here before, you've seen these slides, but uh, for those that are new to our program or new to our Team in Tuesday webinar, um, you cannot unmute or share your video and that is on purpose. So sometimes we have uh, hundreds if not more uh, attendees and we wanna make sure that we are giving our speaker the due attention um, that the topic deserves today. Um, if you're getting to this point in the webinar, you're logging into WebEx and you are seeing my mouth move and you're seeing the slides change, but you're not uh, hearing my voice, you're going to need to check your audio connection. Um, you can't hear me tell you that, but hopefully you can see the slides that is telling you to check your um, audio setting uh, format on your WebEx and uh, make sure your speakers are plugged in, make sure that your volume is turned up um, and that you are able to participate in uh, listening to this, um, this webinar today. Um, for those that are he uh, able to hear us, uh, we want to be able to hear you um, and participate with you through this webinar event. And to do that, we're going to use the chat function. Um, so please use the chat to everyone today to ask questions, to participate um, in the discussion. Michelle and I will be moderators for any questions that may come in and then prompt uh, to our speaker with those questions um, when time allows for those questions to be asked. Um, to help us as facilitators of that chat, please use uh, full sentences, clear grammar, the best spelling you can muster on a Tuesday um, so that we can make sure that we are getting those questions asked as you intended for them to be asked, um, given that we have enough time to ask all the questions today. And as always, please keep all chat uh, on topic and professional for us. Um, quick roundup of all of our TMN Tuesday webinar etiquette. Um, some of this is uh, repetitive. Um, as uh, attendees, you're not able to unmute or share your video. That is on purpose. Uh, the chat function is open for on-topic and professional and respectful discussion today. Um, if you are a master naturalist, you can count today's TMN Tuesday webinar as an advanced training credit. All 2023 TMN Tuesday webinars are allowed to be counted for advanced training in the calendar year of 2023. Um, as we transition to a new calendar year um, here in a, a little over 15 days, um, we'll begin a new TMN Tuesday series that Michelle will tell you about here in just a second. Um, and then if you have any additional WebEx issues, um, we do have uh, a helpline on our website for, um, for our WebEx. All right, Michelle. So our Master Naturalist TMN Tuesdays are, are sponsored and brought to you by our Texas Master Naturalist program. The program at the state level is sponsored both by Texas Parks and Wildlife and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Um, many of you on the call today are already Master Naturalists, so we hope that you are very familiar and well aware of our mission um, and the program. Um, go to the next slide. And if you're new to the Master Naturalist program and you're, you're interested in today's topic, but you want to also get involved um, or become part of the program, we encourage you to do so as this, these webinars are open to any, anyone. Um, they are aimed at our Master Naturalist members, um, but they are open to the public as well. And so if you're new to the program, want to get involved, we encourage you to find your local chapter. Um, visit our website, locate your local chapter. We have many trainings starting in the new year and uh, some application periods are open now. So um, you can find those chapters and their application periods and training schedules coming up um, using the map uh, that looks like this on our website. And the next slide. Um, our uh, this is our 2024 TMN Tuesdays uh, this year, and um, 
we're closing out today with our December and the, and the end of 2023. That is one of our crossover events. So today is serving as a uh, president's meeting. Um, which we do monthly with all of our chapter presidents and a TMN Tuesday um, advanced training event. Our schedule for the 2024 is listed there beginning January 9th um, and uh, taking place monthly with uh, with some edits there too. To the TMN Tuesday series, remember, it is a up to one hour, sometimes a little more, um, advanced virtual advanced training event. It's offered by our state office. Um, it's typically held over the lunch hour, noon hour to give people uh, a little bit of a break during their day um, and join us with a kind of a lunch and learn, brown bag lunch and learn event. Um, they're always free and as I mentioned, available to the public as well. We do record these every month and the recordings will be put on, will be available on our website following the event. Um, once that processes and gets posted, and then members can attend. Member our members, master naturalists, can receive volunteer service, vol advanced training credit for attending live or watching the recordings. Um, and then the next slide. Okay. Um, some end of the year reminders coming up. Um, for all of our members online, just a reminder that the, the end of the year is coming and we'd ask that you get your, your hours reported um, as soon as possible. All 2023 reporting will close February 14th. Um, good way to remember that is Valentine's Day. So happy Valentine's Day. It's the last day to report <laughs> for, for 2023. And um, for members, we ask that you, as you're reporting and kind of closing out that 2023, 2023 year, check and update your VMS, uh, your volunteer management system member profile, and just make sure that the, the contact information there is correct um, going into the new year. And then for chapter leaders, those who are exiting and those who are incoming in the new calendar year, um, please remember to have your chapter leadership update your chapter officers and VMS. And this is an action that your local VMS, VMN, VMS admin can do. Um, they are the person that has access to um, make that update for all of your chapter leadership in, um, in the VMS. So there are some actions that would need to be taken for kind of archiving the leadership for 2023 and then updating the leadership contacts for 2024. Uh, so be sure to include your local VM and admin, admin on that duty. Um, some other reminders going on. We have our TMN apparel winter sale um, going on right now. It closes this week on December 15th. Our season of thanks is still going on. Um, we'd love for you to contribute to that. We have our um, 25th anniversary survey, um, our season of thanks, or going on uh, on social media, um, on Facebook and Instagram. You can visit the links there. And then our um, story, our 25th anniversary storytelling project is still going on as well. You can visit that through the QR code down there in the corner. And last but not least, um, another information and reminder is uh, we have a lot of chapters uh, launching training in 2024. And so it, as a chapter, um, if you could update your chapter's training, new class training information um, to include updated um, application periods and your updated schedule. So all of that can be updated on our website through that link there. Uh, Michelle mentioned our winter sale is continuing through the end of Friday, December 15th, uh, 5 p.m. So please help us uh, think about some uh, Christmas gifts that you may want to give to some of your fellow master naturalists or those that you um, want to share the master naturalist uh, gear with um, in your chapter. And so please log into our AgriLife Learn website um, to, to check out our winter sale. I'll drop that link in the chat here in just a second. Um, another great way to close out the end of the year and think about ways to support the master naturalist program is uh, purchasing our license plate. We have a Texas Master Naturalist license plate available 
through our website um, as you're going through your registration, your vehicle registration process. Please think about uh, supporting the Master Nationalist program with either a personalized plate or a standard non-personalized plate. Um, I'll also drop that link in the chat. And then last but not least, another way to close out end of the year giving um, as part of our season of thanks and our season of giving at the end of 2023, please consider supporting the Texas Master Naturalist Endowment. Um, again, that link will be in the chat here in just a second. And then Michelle, if you'll give us the update on this and then we'll get into our topic. So um, we ask that you uh, complete a survey for us to help us remain eligible to continue funding for this effort in the Master Naturalist program. Um, the survey is completely voluntary um, and it helps us continue events like this. So um, if you're able to complete that, there's a link in the QR, you can use your phone to kind of um, hover over the QR code and take it from there, or we'll drop links into the chat as well. So thank you for your participation. And then last, um, heading into the, our feature uh, event for today, our TMN Tuesday, we are so honored to have with us Steve Nelly today. Um, he will be talking about land stewardship. It might not be what you think. And if you could go to the next slide, do a little introduction of Steve. Um, Steve Nelly is a natural resource specialist and wildlife biologist. Um, and he's been in working in this field for over how many years, Steve? Oh, 47. 47 years. Um, and we, our field, this field is so lucky to have Steve. Um, he's been a great resource. Um, a great advisor, and uh, if you, when you, when you think, when I think about land managers and being in connection with the land and ethics and stewardship, Steve is always the first uh, first name that comes to mind. Um, he worked for over thirty years, many years as um, a natural resource specialist and wildlife biologist with NRCS, and today he's enjoying retirement, but doing the same work. <laughs> At his leisure, right, Steve? <laughs> yes, ma'am. So, um, so excited to have you today. Um, and I couldn't think of a better way to kind of close out the year than uh, with you presenting this topic for our members. Well, thank you very much. We're going to give you sharing rights now, Steve. And you should be able to share your screen here shortly. Okay, you should be able to share your screen now. Let me try that again. Yes, sir. Okay, we see the whole slide deck and now we see the first page. Perfect. Okay. Ready to go. We're sort of ready. To, okay. Well, thank you, Michelle, Mary, Mary Pearl. It's uh, it's an honor to be here, a uh, part of this event today, uh, to talk about land stewardship. It's a topic that uh, is received. Uh, it's it's been a very popular topic uh, for the last twenty years or so. That's a really good trend. Uh, everyone wants to be perceived as a good land steward and that's good uh, so we're going to look into this this subject of land stewardship and i'll try to provide you a description or definition at least from my perspective and it's possible that it may not be exactly what you think it is I'll start off with an acknowledgement that most of the things I'm going to share today uh, did not originate with myself. I learned them from other people. Some of these are some of my mentors uh, that have taught me what genuine land stewardship really is. And so I'm really indebted to the people I've worked with over the years, learning from 
each of them and you look at this group here and they look they look pretty um, traditional and they are because that's the world that I have um, worked in. But I've also had the privilege of working with people who are not so traditional, people who look different than me, who think different. Uh, and I've learned from them also. So it doesn't really matter whether we're talking about traditional agriculture or regenerative agriculture or some of the uh, other aspects of the land. Uh, we learn from everyone that we interact with, and that's probably an important thing for us all to, to keep in mind. So what is land stewardship and what is it not? If you do an internet search, you're going to get all kinds of hits on land stewardship projects programs, all kinds of land stewardship initiatives. There are land stewardship awards of many kinds. There are many organizations, some of you are members of many of them, that uh, have stewardship as a part of their um, mission, including your fine organization. But we need to remember that land stewardship is not primarily a project and it's not a program, and it's not primarily about the giving and receiving of awards. It's not about membership and organizations. These all things are all good, but they're not the same thing as land stewardship, because land stewardship is really about the relationship of a person between a person and a piece of land. In the world that I've worked in, we sometimes equate practices such as brush control or rotational grazing or prescribed fire or perhaps reseeding with native grasses. We sometimes equate practices with stewardship, but really land stewardship is not just a list of practices. Any of these practices can be done properly or they can be done improperly. So it's not the practice that defines stewardship. At a different level, some of you have been involved in perhaps collecting seed from a native prairie to be used in reseeding efforts, removal of invasive plants, the construction and establishment of nest boxes, you know, monitoring plant diversity, or a thousand other activities. All can be good activities, but again, land stewardship is not just a list of practices or activities, no matter how good those activities might be. Because again, land stewardship is really about this relationship that develops between a person and a piece of land. It's, it's the connection between people in the land. And it can look like this. It can look like this. It can look a hundred different ways, but land stewardship is all about that connection and that relationship. There are some things that tend to be true where land stewardship is being carried out. And the first one that comes to mind is there will be healthy soil or at least if the soil is not yet healthy, the trend is toward a more healthy soil. And I'm sure you've received much instruction about that aspect of, of uh, land health. And where there is stewardship and where there is healthy soil, there's going to be healthy and abundant waters. Really just that, that just means that the water cycle is working the way it's supposed to. That doesn't necessarily mean that every piece of land will have springs and running creeks but that the water cycle is working the way it is supposed to. And where there is land stewardship, there will be good wildlife habitat. And it's not just for the species that we hunt, although that is important, uh, part of the stewardship um, equation, but it's good for many species, birds, small mammals, reptiles, insects, the whole big tangled web of ecology, which I'm certain you've been well trained in. 
and where there is land stewardship, there, that's the foundation for productive and profitable agriculture. And I want agriculture to be productive. You know, most of us don't go very long between meals. So agriculture is important to us. It's important that it's profitable because that's how that what justifies people being able to stay on the land and incur the expenses it takes to carry out stewardship. And where there is stewardship, it's going to be, there's going to be natural beauty and aesthetic value because if agriculture feeds our bellies, then aesthetics feed our souls. And both of those are important parts of the stewardship equation. And we need to remember that good stewardship benefits every citizen in Texas. And it's a message that we need to really be very serious and intentional about uh, conveying that message uh, that stewardship benefits everyone, not just landowners, not just ranchers, farmers, and people who own land, everyone benefits. So I hope you can agree with me that land stewardship must be and is the very backbone for sustaining the natural resources and the natural values of Texas. But it's interesting to think that land stewardship is really not a new concept. I'd like for you to listen as I read an account of ancient Greece. This was written by Mr. Plato prior to 400 BC. So here's his description of ancient Greece. He said, in the primitive state of the country, the mountains and hills were covered with soil and there was an abundance of timber. The plains were full of rich earth, bearing an abundance of food for cattle. Moreover, the land reaped the benefit of the annual rainfall, receiving the rainfall into herself and storing it up in the soil. The land let off the water into the hollows, which it absorbed from the heights, providing everywhere abundant fountains and rivers. To me, that's a picture of a, of a beautifully functional water cycle, productivity, uh, everything that we want to be true in Texas. And here's how he ended the description. He said, such was the state of the country, which was cultivated by true husbandmen who made husbandry their business with a soil the best in the world and an abundance of water. So I don't know if the cowboys in Plato's days wore denim shirts and blue jeans, but they understood what it means to take care of the land. And these two words, um, seem to be having trouble with forwarding the, here we go. Um, these two terms here that he used, husband, men, and husbandry, is exactly the same thing as what we mean today when we use the word stewardship. Those are synonymous terms, land husbandry, and the person who acts as a husband of the land. So I still haven't defined land stewardship, but we can find out a lot about it from these two gentlemen. I'm certain you've heard of Aldo Leopold, you know about him. You may or may not have heard of Mr. John Merrill, who died a couple of years ago. Mr. Merrill was the director of the world famous TCU ranch management program. He was a livestock producer, a rancher, an educator. And in my book, he was perhaps Mr. Land Stewardship, one of my mentors. I'm certain that you've read a Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold. Perhaps it would be something good this winter to reread it again. Anyway, here's what Mr. Merrill says about a man's relationship to the land. He said, one cannot work closely with the land for very long without developing a deep respect and appreciation for its character and capabilities. Here's how Leopold says it, that little different words, same idea. It is inconceivable to me 
that an ethical relation to the land can exist without love, respect, and admiration for land and a high regard for its value. So from these two gentlemen, from this pretty short excerpts, we can see what this stewardship relation to the land consists of. It entails a deep respect for the land, an appreciation for the land, the acknowledgement that the land has character and has capability, that one can have an ethical relationship to the land, that one can love the land, literally love the land, have admiration for the land, and a high regard for its value, not high regard for the what it will produce as much as just a regard and admiration for the land itself. So really, land stewardship is about who you are on the inside. It's about your values and your attitudes and what motivates you and inspires you. So with that, let me provide a description or a definition of land stewardship based on these ideas. Land stewardship is a deeply held inner conviction that motivates landowners to care for and sustain the land that has been entrusted to them. And why do they do it? Well, partially, yes, for their own personal benefit, including uh, financial benefit, but also for the benefit to future generations and for the benefits that accrue to society. And this perhaps is what sets apart the genuine land steward that they realize that what they do on their land benefits others. And so there's a great deal of benevolence involved in genuine land stewardship. Here's how one ranch describes their stewardship ethics. They say, we realize that the decisions we make on this ranch have a rippling effect. In other words, they're acknowledging that what they do affects others. Our goal is to improve the ecological health of the land while at the same time making a living for ourselves. So here we see the ecological sustainability, we see economic sustainability. And so what more can we ask of landowners than to have this as their model and their ethics? So the land steward is a caretaker of the land. It's a, he's a conservator. They are one who practices husbandry of the land. And that entails the love for the land and the care for the land and being a custodian of the land. And the person can look like that, very traditional, or it can look like this or a hundred or a thousand other ways. But what sets them apart is being a caretaker and a custodian of what has been entrusted to them. Leopold said that a land ethic reflects the existence of an ecological conscience. And he went on to say, and this in turn reflects a conviction of individual responsibility for the health of the land. Now that one sentence is a mouthful and there's a great deal contained in that one statement. The word stewardship is not there but this is the essence of stewardship. The person will have a tender conscience toward the land and toward all of the ecological dynamics that are taking place. That conscience produces a conviction, an inner conviction so that the person takes responsibility for the health and the well-being of that land. It's not up to anybody else. They take their own responsibility for caring for and being that caretaker of the land. So here's a kind of a stereotypical old West Texas rancher. You look at him and he looks pretty crusty. He looks pretty independent. How many of you would like to go up to that gentleman and tell him how you think he should operate that land? You know, that conversation might not go very well because landowners are often independent 
And, um, but Leopold said that an ethic ecologically is a limitation of freedom of action. And what that means is that a land steward, such as this old gentleman here, he doesn't have to be told or coerced or arm twisted in what to do. He has these internal voluntary limitations in what he will and will not do with that land. It's legal to overgraze every blade of grass. It would be legal to spray every weed and forb and brush. It would, it's legal to kill every quail or every turkey or every deer on a piece of land. Those are things are not illegal, but for the land steward, they place on themselves a voluntary limitation of what they will and will not do. And so that is kind of what motivates the land steward, regardless of how they may look on the outside. Leopold also said that the landscape of any farm is the owner's portrait of himself. Think about that statement. It's very profound because for the land steward, the land becomes a part of who they are. And who they are becomes a part of the land. They almost become inseparable. The person and the land become attached or connected in a way that's it's very difficult to understand if, if, you, if you don't have that relationship. For many of the best landowners or uh, land stewards that I've worked with, there is a, a very strong and meaningful um, spiritual dimension to land stewardship. And here's how they would express it. They would say that if you acknowledge that God created everything that we call nature, and if you acknowledge that God put men and women in a position of responsible stewardship of that creation, then you are going to be extremely motivated to do the very best job you can. And you're going to ask for and derive wisdom from God on how you treat and manage that piece of land. So that's a very, uh, it's a very strong part of land stewardship for many of the people that I've uh, had the privilege of working with. And there's a parallel between financial stewardship and land stewardship. If you were placed as the steward or the administrator of someone else's assets, your job would be, of course, first to protect the principal, but beyond that, to use those assets wisely. You don't bury them in the ground, you use them, you invest them, and you generate profit and growth and benefit. That's what a successful financial steward does. And it's the very same thing with land stewardship, protecting the principle, which is the soil and the plants and the whole ecological dynamic. You're protecting the principle, but then you're using those assets wisely and you're generating benefit for yourself and for others. So there are those parallels between uh, stewardship these are some of the characteristics that I have noticed from many of the people who uh, seem to me to be genuine land stewards. First, there's a high degree of knowledge. There's knowledge of the soil, the water, the plants, the animals, the whole ecological dynamic. And it's not just book knowledge, it's practical knowledge. It's developing the skills and ability to manage those parts of, of nature uh, to carry out stewardship. So they're very concrete, uh, practical skills. These people are highly committed. It's not a pastime. It's not a part-time for them. They're deeply, deeply committed to the land and uh, to caring for it. And they have a passion about what they do. Now they may or may not stand up and beat their chest and proclaim how much they love the land, but if you spend time with them, you see that passion and that zeal that they have, and it is contagious. 
these are people of perseverance. They know that there will be setbacks when you work with nature and there, and you have to just to keep on going through the drought, the wildfire, the diseases, all of the things that are part of nature. And they strive to see the big picture. The gentleman here may be a livestock producer, but he's not just interested in livestock or wildlife. He's interested in the whole big picture of the water cycle and plant diversity and long-term stewardship. And they are people that are realistic because they know that nature calls the shots, perhaps even more than they do. So they roll with the punches. They don't try to force the land to produce more than what it's capable of. And they do attempt to look at the long-term perspective. It's not just about today or tomorrow. It's about the next generation and the next generation after that. So these are some of the characteristics that tend to uh, be true in the genuine land steward. And then lands that are taken care of in this way also show the effects of stewardship. They tend to be more biologically diverse. And when land is more diverse, it tends to be more stable. And when land is more stable, it is more resilient, which means it bounces back faster after natural disturbances, after the wildfires, after the droughts, after the insect devastations, it's more resilient. And it tends to stay in balance over time, a little bit uh, perhaps better than other lands. And it's functioning the way it's supposed to, the way it was created. And the steward understands the balance and the function of land. Stewardship lands, are, tend to be more productive. And when land is more productive, it has the capacity to be more profitable. And then stewardship lands tend to be more self-sustaining, more natural, less artificial. And there's another aspect of stewardship, which is really important. You see the old man standing on the right bank of the Blanco River. He's getting on up in age. He knows he's not going to be around forever. Old people start thinking about the future. What's going to happen to this land after I'm gone? Will my children and my grandchildren love this land the way I have loved it? Will they take care of that land the way I have taken care of it? That's what old land stewards think about. They're thinking about the future. So there is also stewardship, not only of the present, but of the future after you're gone. All across the country and our state, families are thinking about those things. How or am I going to transfer my stewardship ethics to my children and to my grandchildren and to instilling that desire to, to be a genuine land steward? And it's not just about men in blue jeans and cowboy hats. It can just as easily be about grandma teaching her daughter and her granddaughter about what she has learned about the flowers and butterflies and bees on maybe that was grandpa's farm at one time. And she's trying to instill that stewardship, that love, that respect, that admiration for the land. And I think you all know about what's happening, the trends in Texas, the, the fragmentation. I'm certain you've uh, are alarmed about that as much as anyone. The uh, division of larger tracks into smaller tracks, the division of smaller tracks into even smaller tracks. And in this example here, a modest size track divided six ways, six new roads, six new houses, six new barns, six new septic tanks, six new wells. And we can see the effect that this is having on the natural and ecological dynamics of the land. And there's another example and we see it all around us. It has been said that those who do not understand nature are destined 
to deplete it. The picture here shows overgrazing, but that's just one way that land is depleted. Land fragmentation is, is another way. And there are lots of different ways that land can be depleted, but it tends to go back to ignorance. When people don't understand nature, then the, the outcome often is depletion. So that's a sad truth. It's a true, it's a true uh, statement, but the corollary to that is good news. And the corollary is that those who understand nature best are compelled to conserve it. They're not forced, they're not coerced, but they are compelled and inspired to take care of it because we do tend to take better care of things that we understand. And that perhaps is one of the main primary purposes of the Texas Master Naturalist Program to help people understand nature better. And then we're gonna be compelled and want to take better care of it. This picture also illustrates some characteristics of land stewards. It's one of my favorite pictures. And what it shows is the old gentleman and his wife were headed to town. They lost the wheel on their tractor. And so they have a dilemma. So the old gentleman had to turn around to his wife and say, sweetheart, would you please move over to the other side of that tractor and lean out just a little bit so that we can continue on our journey. It illustrates the need for flexibility, to always have a plan B, for innovation and for creativity. Likewise, in land stewardship, the answers are not found in any book. You have to be innovative and creative enough to see what needs to be done and to make those kind of modifications. Land stewardship also involves understanding the choices we make. This old cow, has, uh, she's in a little bit of a predicament. Uh, it's a little bit of an awkward situation. She's made her choice. And sometimes the choices we make in life and on the land can have unpleasant consequences. So the land steward is one who learns from their mistakes and don't make the same mistakes over and over again. It's like this crazy deer hunter. The idea is to consider the consequences and side effects of our decisions before the consequences kick in. And so we're all, you're always thinking about what is gonna be a possible side effect or consequence of the things that I do to the land. These are things that land stewards are constantly thinking about. So land stewardship is not defined by how many pounds of beef is produced per acre. It's not measured by how big a horns you can grow on white-tailed deer. It's not defined by how many species of birds you have listed or by how many different flowers that exist. All of these things may be good and important but these are not the measure of land stewardship because land stewardship is about this connection and this relationship between people and the land. And it always has an eye toward the future. This guy is both learning and he's teaching. And that's an important aspect of land stewardship. The, the fact that there will always be learning there will always be teaching, and we all need to be involved in both of these, whether it's in an agricultural setting like this or whether it's in a setting like this. Take every opportunity you can always to be learning and then to turn around and be a good steward of what you have learned and help to teach others. And I know that many of you are doing that, and that's part of what we're doing today. Because again, this idea of stewardship is not just a, about a list of things we do. It's about the love for the land. It's about the relationship with the land. Always being a student of the land, realizing there, that there are no easy answers. There's no cookbook, simple solutions.
an African ecologist once said that we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught. And so all of these things are just little pieces of the stewardship puzzle, recognizing these truths. And so strive to become a great teacher of the things that you're learning in your chapter and the things you will learn on, on your piece of land. These are two of the best teachers that I had uh, during my career. And here's the definition from William Ward of what a great teacher is. He says, the mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates, but the great teacher inspires. So that should be our goal, is not just to tell facts and explain things, but to also find a way to inspire others about the passion that we have about the land, the soil, the water, the plants, the animals, all of the ecological things that are happening. This idea of land, caring for the land, is a very complex endeavor. And I'm not gonna read all these things, but look at some of the aspects of what is required to understand and think about as a person cares for a piece of land, the plant cover, the litter cover. And again, I won't read each one of these, but these are pieces of the land care puzzle. How much bare ground in erosion? What's the condition of the soil? Water quality recharge. The objectives of each landowner, the economic picture, the tradition and culture, all of these things, the family issues, the state issues, these are all things that landowners think about, whether it's a large tract or a small tract, it doesn't matter, is labor available, energy production, neighbors, fragmentation, all of these things, grazing management, wildlife management, pigs, exotics, brush, weeds, invasive species, and the list goes on and on and on. Animal health, predators. These are just some of the things that land stewards think about, that landowners think about. And that's probably just the tip of the iceberg. But how does a person, whether it's 10 acres or 10,000, juggle all of these factors in their day-to-day -day operation? And I would say that these things can only be understood and uh, managed within the context of land stewardship ethics as their foundation. Without the ethics, I think it would be impossible to juggle and manage and manipulate all these things in a proper fashion. So the results of stewardship, when stewardship is being carried out at the landscape level, these are some of the things that are gonna result. There's going to be healthy soil, cleaner water, more sustained flows, sustainable productive agriculture, fish and wildlife habitat, beauty, recreation, aesthetic value, and these things, not just today, not just tomorrow, not just next year, but the next generation and forever. These are some of the th things that will result when people have these stewardship ethics. So I wanna end here with a tribute, a tribute to the land, a thing of great value, a thing of great beauty, worthy of our greatest efforts to manage and take care of. Here's to some of the things that come from the land, water, food, livelihoods, wildlife, and the list could go on and on. Here's to the people who take care of the land, whether it's a quarter acre lot or a large ranch or farm, the men and women who practice these stewardship ethics in their day-to-day -day operation of the property. 
And finally, here's to you, the Texas Master Naturalist, as individuals, as chapters, uh, an organization that I'm very proud to be a small part of and to have been associated with. I think the world of this organization, I've seen how well you do things and you have my utmost respect and admiration. So that's the, really the message that I came to deliver today. I wanna thank you for investing uh, part of your day to hear at least one person's perspective on stewardship. So I'm going to exit the uh, presentation now and uh, see if there's any discussions that we might want to have. So thank you. Steve, as always, you are just the most inspiring speaker, presenter. You summed up all of my feelings and I think all of Michelle's feelings for how we view the impact of the Master Naturalist program. Um, and, and the power of the stewards that, that thrive within the program uh, that we have here. There's well, nothing thank you. but admiration for you and your message and um, how inspirational it was in the chat. So um, I, gosh, I just wanna thank you for this gift today in this gift giving season. <laughs> well, it's my, it's my pleasure. There was a question earlier, Michelle. Uh, um, it's at the top of the list of all of the thanks and, in, and inspiring messages that are coming in alongside uh, the conclusion of your presentation. Let me see if I can find it. If you're willing to stay, Steve, for just a few questions, we've got I'm a few certain. questions. Yes, I'm willing to stay as long as we need. Yes. Uh -huh. Great. Let me find those. One of the questions that I saw early on, and I, I think you answered this, is um, is how those that uh, Bob asked the question, in addition to doing land stewardship for one's personal benefit, for the benefit of society, um, there are those that may be doing it for the benefit of specific species of interest, specific non-game or game species. There's those that have a, a connection to um, a specific uh, part of the whole that they are working to um, to steward. It wasn't a question. It was more of just what what about doing it for those different parts of of the whole? Well, you know, it's all important and it's all part of the equation. But I think that land stewardship, uh, you do both close up examination toward individual species, whether it's songbirds or whatever, flowers, but then you have to back off and see the big picture. You have to see how your part that you're interested in is connected to all the other parts. So it's really essential that you do both. Uh, up close with the flowers, the bugs, the cows, the deer, whatever you're interested in, but that's just a part of it. You have to back off and make yourself look at the big picture. Uh, here comes a great question in from uh, Danny. Uh, he says, I live on a piece of property that has a large stormwater retention area that cannot be built on. How can I find out the best way to maintain this piece of property in a sustainable and natural state if I don't know what that would look like? Well, the, you know, specific things like that are hard to address on, yeah. on like a webinar. You, you have to find someone in your area who understands nature and ecology and uh, these regulatory things and you know, take them out there, walk on the land with them, look at it, discuss things. And, and frankly, there's not easy answers to a lot of these things. And uh, so it's just going to be trying to figure it out on each individual chunk of land, whether it's part of your backyard or a park or uh, stormwater retention. Uh, so I can't really give anything specific without you know, you need no, to see I, it I understand. with someone else. I think part of the question there and something that, that I know that I've struggled with is 
um, is where, where do I find that balance of, of restoring the land to its natural state and what was the natural state? So I live in the post Oak Savannah, um, and, and what was the natural state that I am, what's my target, uh, for my land? Where am I trying to steward it to? What are the resources? Uh, it's historic, to yeah, that. it's historic range. Um, so to speak, when we've altered the state of our ranges in so many ways that this post oak savanna was a true savanna with not a tree in sight. Um, but, but would that be my end goal at this point or kind of where to balance out that, um, that, that end goal for your, uh, for your property? It's, it's a beautiful, um, thing to want to restore a piece of land to what we think it once was. And many people have that as, as a part of their vision. And I hear people telling me that all the time, they want to restore this piece of land to what it was. So it may or may not be possible. That's the first thing to consider that we are in a new normal. Yeah. Texas can, will never be restored to what it was um, because of all the obvious things we're aware of. But for an for a individual piece of land, it may be possible to restore at least a part of what was natural. And so there again, part of that is finding the people in your area who understand that. The other part is doing your research and doing your due diligence. Mm -hmm. So the book that I would recommend for anyone to try to acquire is called... Um, see if I can hold it up here. Can you read that? Yes, sir. The Explorers, Explorers Texas, The Lands and Waters by Dale Winnegar. That may be showing up backwards to you. Nope, <laughs> it is got it. on my screen. But anyway, uh, so what Mr. Winnegar, Dr. Winnegar did was he went back pre-1860 and compiled all of the early accounts of the explorers who wrote their diaries and journals. And so first we have to know what was the land like. And some of the perceptions we have, we've been taught, turns out are not accurate. So go back and do your homework. And then, uh, so it is possible to do some restoration, but be realistic because we no longer live in the day of the bison and the wolf. And uh, so some of it's not gonna be possible, but some of it is, especially with some restoring some plant diversity. Absolutely. Um, I don't see any other questions, but I, I wanna spend just a second reading some of the, the uh, thanks, the messages of thanks that have come in. Um, and Michelle, I'm sure there's some that you'll find in here uh, as well. Um, but there's been quite a few folks that agree that this should be viewing by uh, all incoming master naturalists as they be begin their master naturalist career. Um, your presentation here today is a way to really articulate the values of the Texas master naturalist um, and, and our program. There is quite a few folks that said, uh, your commitment to the land is apparent and heartfelt, um, wonderful and inspirational, refreshing perspective. Um, Tina says that she heard in the background the, uh, the song, this land is your land, this land is my land, uh, at the conclusion of your presentation. Um, and, and again, just yeah. so many uh, wonderful thanks and uh, uh, saying how wonderful they uh, thought your talk was today. Well, I appreciate all the comments and appreciate everyone tuning in. And if I can be of help, you know, to, to any of you as individuals or as chapters, you know, don't hesitate to, to contact me. We appreciate that. Um, I don't have any other questions that have come in at this point, Steve. Um, but again, we want to thank you for, uh, for your time today, for your presentation. Um, and, and we'll look forward to having you join us, uh, uh, again in the future with the Master Naturalist chapters or at the state level. Well, I would look forward to that. you got a great organization, lots of good people I've met. Thank you they for being a part of it.
Keep up the good work. Yes, sir. Thank you so very much. All right. For our master naturalist, I'm going to get this recording posted on our website. If not by uh, this afternoon, it'll be up first thing tomorrow morning. Um, and you'll have a wonderful holiday season for uh, the next couple of weeks. And we'll see you again with our Team and Tuesday series in 2024. Thanks, everyone.